Hi there. All right, guys, cool. Looks like it's set and ready to go. So let's talk about part of our first assignment. Our first assignment is going to be, this is an introduction class to character design, okay? Um, in order to understand, I'm changing the class up a little bit from how I used to teach it. One of the things I really wanted to talk about was um, the use of the flower sack. And the flower sack is extremely important because even animators, and not that you guys are animators, but there is a huge similarity between character design and animation. And that similarity is producing key framed drawings of characters in motion, okay? And part of that process is really having a good understanding of how to draw and manipulate form and how to draw something from numerous angles. And at the same time, while you're doing that, having the ability to understand shape and weight, okay? And how form attaches to make your character. So one of the great things about drawing a flower sack is it, it gets you to focus on weight, line of action, okay? Primary and secondary animation, which we'll talk about a little bit. Primary, primary animation would be the weight of the bag as it's moving or doing a particular gesture. The secondary would be something smaller, like for example, the little tails of the flower sack on the top, the tails of the flower, the, the feet, which are the flower, the, of the flower sack on the bottom, how they're moving, how they're interacting. You can use those as little secondaries, okay? Squash and stretch, meaning try to avoid having the same size bag all the time. Try to squash it and stretch it as it is moving or doing something, okay? Part of that ties into the expression, which is there's not only a horizontal squash and stretch, there's also a vertical squash and stretch that you can apply, okay? Also, now ex I mentioned expression here. Well, the bag is faceless, so that makes it a little bit more difficult. So you have to think about, you know, you can pull off showing expression inside a bag. The other thing, and I'll show you in a minute, a couple of samples. The other thing is interaction, having your flower sack interact with something else. A great example to that is right down here. This artist has the flower sack actually carrying like a round ball. And you can see it's like pulling the weight of the bag back and then trying to walk at the same time, okay? Another form of interaction might be, you know, your flower sack sort of standing there and, you know, maybe trying to jump over a log or maybe it's resting on a little pedestal. Even if it's sitting on the pedestal or a chair, it's still interacting. In fact, what if it was, here's something that I would probably sketch. What if it was just a box, okay, and the flower sack sitting there, it's upright like it's paying attention, then draw that same pose with the flower sack like it's been sitting there for four hours and it's like, falling out and it's starting to slide off the base of the box, that's going to be a totally different feel, okay? So um, just have fun with it. Get in there. Try to produce, you know, I mentioned this comment that usually your first page is your worst page, okay? So I want you, I'm going to give you time to work on this, you know, obviously over this weekend and then in the next week as well. I was aiming for Thursday. If that's not enough time, maybe we'll move it to Tuesday, okay? I'm all about quality than I am like tons of quantity. Um, some instructors have you do a ton of pages. I think I was asking for, I forget it, I think it was three or four, but um, just fill up your pages and have fun with this. This is a huge um, importance that translates right into design and understanding some of the basics of what I'm trying to teach you about that your first page and your first rendition of something is never your finished product, okay? Uh, good designers, good animators, good artists, good environment designers. We do multiple pages and sketches to get to a final derivative of something. And when you go through part of that process, I call that the design process, which unfortunately isn't taught at too many schools or colleges anymore. Okay, it's not even taught in basic drawing anymore. In basic drawing, they have you look at one still life and you copy it. No one talks about getting up and moving around the room and taking different positions and finding the right composition that works best for you, okay? So take a look at some of the samples that I put up here online. These are just some, some sample drawings that I grabbed from, sorry, that's a duplicate in there, I think, right? Some samples that I grabbed from Pinterest, looking around. So whenever I do anything in this class, I always put up samples for you so you have a better idea of what I'm sort of aiming for. This is really cool. Someone did this, where they did rough sketches, and then at the same time, they went back over them, okay? And there's something to say about that. I wanted to talk a little bit about that today, because um, one of the problems that happens in drawing, especially in animation, is as people start to sketch, 
they get very tied up in their sketches and they make their bags look perfect. And that's not the thing to do. The thing to do that works in the industry is you need to incorporate life and gesture into part of your drawing. And the way to do that is to be really rough. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and demo now for you a little bit. All right, I wanna, there's a couple different topics that I wanna talk about, okay? Um, first off, we're using Sketchbook Pro unless you really wanna use Photoshop, okay? It's up to you. If you want to use Photoshop, let me know, and l later on I can give you, I have a couple little drawing brushes that work really well that sort of mimic pencil. Sketchbook Pro is pretty simple. You saw I just double clack, I can't talk today, double click, not clacked, double clicked the little icon there. It opens up, and this is pretty much what it looks like. You can literally learn how to use Sketchbook Pro in about 10 or 15 minutes. There are even videos online. I'm going to give you a quick rundown of it, super quick, literally, all we're doing is we're using layers and we're using the brush tool. Excuse me, when I say brush, I'm always thinking of Photoshop and here it's the pencil, okay? So let me show you really quickly. I'm gonna move this mic back just a little bit here. Okay, when you open this up, if for some reason you have, uh-oh, ah, uh, same thing's happening where I'm losing my, uh, my, I have four inch difference now on my pen. Let me try the other pen see if this makes a difference. I've been having this issue lately in the software. Okay, it's doing the same thing. So do you see where my cursor is? It's four inches away from what I'm trying to draw right now. So let me see if I can fix this really quick. So I, I'm gonna get, give you the, over, the overview using my mouse real quick, but I can't draw with my mouse. Let's say for some reason you opened up Sketch Pro, Sketchbook Pro and you have this and the screen's completely empty. Don't worry, it's literally super simple. If you come up here and you go to the window, you have this opportunity, you can say toolbar, there's your toolbar, you come back over to window. Even sometimes it might say color puck, it's not there, you have to click it off and then click it back on and then it'll come back up, okay? Let's say, uh, mine does that at home sometimes where for some reason it gets a little little weird. Brush palette, okay, there's your brushes, right? Um, and let's say you want your color sections, okay? All right, so if I come back over to here, we look again, um, you can just go through this. Here's my layer editor. Now I have my layers over on the side. To introduce a new layer, it's really easy. You just right button, okay? Excuse me, thinking of my mouse at home. Press down on the layer, and there's add, there's delete, there's to rename. You just go to add, voila, you have a new layer, okay? Um, now, we, we'll talk about size a little bit later, but you always wanna make sure your image, your standard size image is working okay. That's in any document that you have Photoshop. So if I come over here and I go down to image, I go to image size, double check this standard default is usually a smaller image. It's a 100 DPI image, okay? So if we're gonna be going to print, print publication DPI is 300 DPI. So when you have something that's really great quality, and you want to give it to me to put like in our entertainment art book that we that we try to make every four years, okay? I need your image to be at least 300 DPI. So right now you'd have to click over on this. If you try, if you do a drawing at 100 DPI and you try to raise the DPI to about 300, it's not going to work. So it's it's imperative. Now sometimes you could land in the middle at about 200 DPI or 250 and then you could bring it up. And one of the problems that happens in Sketchbook Pro is when you increase the DPI size, it makes the brush look smaller because there's more dots per inch. So I'm gonna come over here right now, I'm gonna type in three, and you can see I went from a 5.7 megabyte file to a 65.7 megabyte file, okay? It changes it drastically. If I hit okay, what it's done now is it's just increased the dots per inch on my file here. That's important for me because um, if Kai does this really awesome set of sketches and he wants to give them to me to put them in the book, I can't use them if they're 100 DPI, right? That's not print resolution. Print resolution is always 300. So I get in this habit when I'm at home that I just start sketching in 300 all the time, okay? So look, I'm gonna come over here. That is so weird, no, it's still not fixed, okay? Let me see if I can calibrate really quick. Hold on, resume. Okay, so let me finish talking a little bit about just the base overview of the software here. So all you need is the pencil, okay? And all you have to do is come over. If you wanna get your color icon up, if you look up here, everything is above you right there that you need. Um, you don't even need to use half of this stuff here. All you need to use is your basic color option and your layers. I usually keep this out because I'm usually rotating 
between colors, sometimes I go from a light blue to a dark blue, okay? Well, why would I do that? Remember what I was just talking about? Uh, I showed you a sample when people were, uh, sorry, hold on a minute. I'm getting very frustrated right now. Okay. All right, sorry about that. We're having lots of technical issues today. This is always what happens in the first week, okay? So um, back here, now you can see this, right? So if you come over here, select your color that you wanna sketch with, make sure you're on pencil, make sure you have a layer that's ready, okay? And look, you just start sketching, okay? Uh, now remember, you can, I'm not gonna get the sensitivity to show you that I want to, you can get it on your screens. My driver's not working, I have to restart my machine. So if you sit here and you sketch, remember, to work on layers if you want. If you come over here, I'm drawing with a mouse right now. Let's say that's the shape that you really like, okay? You could come over here, you can drop the opacity down on this layer by grabbing this little bar that's on the right-hand side. You wanna make another layer on top of it, you add the other layer. You can come back over to this blue, okay? And you can even pick a darker version of that blue, which then allows you to come over and draw back on top of your previous drawing, okay? So I'm gonna stop the recorder right here because I'm really frustrated right now that I can't draw with my pen because I can't draw with a mouse. So let me restart the machine. Let me save the file really quick. We'll come back and let me try to show you the demo properly. So the software is literally this user friendly. You open it up, you go over, you pull up your layers, you pull up your color, you select the pencil and the pencil literally draws like pencil. It's one of the most amazing software programs that literally mimic blue pencil or I should say pencil in general, okay? I use it all the time at home for sketching. Most of the artists that I, I know use it as well. You can draw in this and then bring it into Photoshop as long as you save the file correctly. The standard default save file for uh, Sketchbook Pro is a TIFF file, okay? So that's just the way it works and um, the mo it's the most convenient format for them to use. So sometimes you have to think about that if you're going back and forth between Photoshop and Sketchbook Pro, you need to remember to save your file as a TIFF because sometimes if you save your file as a PSD, I have encountered different versions where the PSD format might flatten some of your layers and the layers don't read inside Sketchbook Pro. Okay, all right, so let me stop the recorder right now. Um, just getting really annoyed with what's happening here today. All right, here we are, we're back again after starting uh, my computer, let's hope it works. All right. So two other things to show you really quick, okay? Um, here's your, your Sketchbook Pro outline, so we're just talking about the use of the brush, okay? Now let's see how nice it is, everything's working and I can draw a little. So you can see the line quality with the sensitivity, I'm like barely pushing down right now, and then when I push down a little bit, so I can get those nice thick and thin lines. That's extremely important uh, for sketching, because it can pick up my sensitivity of my wrist in my drawing inside the sketch. Now, I, sometimes I'll walk around and I see students that are like this, they're going, uh, and they're drawing a character, and I'm like, dude, stop pressing on the pen so hard. It's so nice and soft. You have this ability to get in there and to sketch very lightly and to make things look very cool, okay? So, with that said and done, the other thing I wanted to show you was this little guy right here. They call this a puck, okay? because it looks like a little hockey puck. And you can grab your puck by touching the outside circle and you can move it around pretty much anywhere that you like. The thing that the puck does is the puck allows me to enlarge the size, okay? Now I wanna go back and show you this. I'm gonna go back under image here, image size. This image, remember, standard defaults 100 DPI, okay? So look at my line right now at 100 DPI. It's very light and gets very thick like so. Okay, if I come down under image here, image, image size, and I'm gonna modify the size of this, put it to 300 DPI, hit okay. My line just shrunk down there because I added more dots per inch. And also when I draw next to it right now, you see the difference? I haven't changed the size of my brush. Look at how thin my line is. It's incredibly thin because I've increased so, much, so many dots per inch. So what I have to do is I have to be able to adjust my line weight size and I do that by holding it over the puck, dragging it to the right, and when I do that, you see what it tells me down below there? It tells me my size is increasing. That's important because you wanna look at the size that works best for you and remember it. 
I tend to be somewhere about like 4.8 or 5 and that gives me enough line quality where I can be very thin but then I can press down and get a little bit dark and when I'm at 300 dpi file I'm about 5.3 ish okay so look you can go all the way up to like 7 and I'm just dragging on the puck I'm up at 9 so look at my line weight now it's very crisp very thin okay so let me just sort of zoom into that so it gives you a little bit better idea. Look at how crisp and thin that is. There's no jagged edges. Allows me to get in there. I can be very rough in the way that I'm sketching and it really comes out nice. So that's one of the first things I really like to talk about because students will open up Sketchbook Pro, do these beautiful drawings. They go to print and guess what happens? It's blurry. Why is it blurry? Your DPI is too low. You have to adjust the DPI, tell it to be at 300. It's literally that simple. Okay, now that that's set and done, let's start talking about the flower sack real quick. Okay, so when you when you sketch this flower sack, your first page is going to tend to be probably one of your worst pages. And it's not that you're a bad artist or anything. It's a common practice when you start sketching something, you start with like real basics. So you might look at a flower sack and you might come over here. That might be like your first comp at it. Okay. Then you're like, oh yeah, I forgot they have little corners. Okay, so then you add on your little corners. So that might be flower sack one. Eventually, you can only draw the flower sack from a front view for so long because it's going to start to feel a little bit boring. And then you're going to want to start tilting your sack a little bit and thinking about how it feels or how it might look. Okay? And then by tilting it what we're starting to do we're starting to get into though it's a flower sack we're getting into really simple basics that deal with this term called contrapasta which those of you that have had a figure drawing is understanding how human shape and form bend at different angles in fact in contrapasta one of the secrets about the human figure is this okay it's this angle set right here that when your shoulders go this way your hips have to go this way to counter angle it okay so if you have somebody standing like this their hips have to adjust a little bit like this and then that helps to establish also part of the weight leg of an individual and how they're standing it adjusts their arms they're also with a little bit of a tilt okay and that's sort of the basic principle on how part of that contrapasta system works reason I'm explaining that is you can start to do that in your bag a little bit. So if you're sketching your bag, your flower sack, and you're coming over here and you're thinking, hey, my character right here might have a little bit of a tilt here. Phil told me about contrapasta, so maybe the top of the character ends up tilting opposite to that other angle. So by doing this, it makes the bag look and appear like he's having a little bit he, she, it, whatever you want to call it, is having a little bit of a weight adjustment. See that? Okay. So we have sort of a rough angle in there, rough angle in there. Not that you have to do it every drawing. I'm just trying to throw this out to you so you start thinking about counter angles. Counter angles are something that we use in design all the time. So for example, um, if I'm drawing an environment and if I have an old like wooden fence, Okay, it's like here, it's in the ground, and then I'm gonna have it like here, and then maybe some, another board here, another board here. One of the things that we start to do when we're sketching part of our fence line here is we immediately go into counter angles. We have one angle here, and then we have another angle countering. Maybe we switch back, we have a couple more going in the same. Counter angles make drawings and make things feel a little bit more interesting, okay? So that's the first thing I wanted to mention to you, that if you end up having your bag having the same angles all the time, perfectly horizontal across, it's going to look boring and it's not going to be that interesting. So you have to find a way to start shifting part of your form to make it more, you know, interesting to the viewer, okay? And it'll make your bag look a little bit better, okay? The next thing to do is I know the bag might be some of you are like, I've never had to draw a flower sack. This sucks, and I'm no good at it. Well, you also need to think about you know, treating your flower sack like a human figure in terms of gesture. So here's something that you can do. If you think about the base of your sack, excuse me, 
go back to blue. If you think about the base of your sack always having the visual weight, okay, then you come over here and you start thinking about there being sort of a head to your sack. And then if you come in here and you throw a gesture line on there, that gesture line and these two circle shapes are going to give you a feel to your sack like it's perhaps doing something or looking at something. You see how that works, okay? By starting this way, then coming in and filling in some of your interior lines, it's going to make it a lot easier, okay? So now if I come in here, maybe my little sack guy is standing here. Okay. So that's how I add a little bit more weight and a little bit more movement to my sack as I start treating it with this thing right here, which there's a term for. We call this a line of action. Okay. So even though a flower sack is just a boring little sack, that's why we sort of give it to you. And that's why animators do this, you know, all the time. In fact, there are a lot of artists that I know that in every morning when they start to draw, they get up and they sketch like simple shapes, circles, and they do little flower sacks, and they do little, little cubes rotated at different angles. That's to go through what we call like a break-in period, okay? So as you're sketching, what I just mentioned before this was about the counter angles and about contrapposta, right? Also, by coming in and starting with these sort of squashed shapes, it allows you to think about what your sack might be doing and what are part of the angles of the movement and how that all starts to come together okay you see how that starts to work so by me thinking about these little sphere shapes in there it's going to help me adapt some form of a line of action and some form of a movement with what my character is doing okay and they don't have to be vertical you could come over here and you could throw the care. Maybe the sack is looking at something like this. Okay. All right. Now, I'm going to cover that was t so topic number one, as we talked about. I'm going to write it out for you. Come back here to our main page. Okay. Topic number one. These are little suggestions I like to give you that help you in your design process. Okay. Topic number one was counter angle. Okay. Topic number two now was line of action. Okay, topic number three now is going to be construction. Eventually, as you're drawing your bag, there's going to hit a point where part of your line of action in your character is only going to go so far. Okay, and what's going to happen is there's going to be a point in time where you are going to want to draw part of your, your sack from maybe a front or side view to figure out how it's working, okay? So one thing that's gonna help you in doing that is going to be understanding some form of base construction. And here is a really simple method that I teach students in basic figure drawing. I don't teach figure drawing here, but when I talk about construction and like basic drawing for entertainment arts, this helps, okay? Try this, this is what you do. You start off and what you're gonna do is you're gonna sketch a light base for understanding that you have a ground plane, okay? The main part of the sack is going to be slightly above that ground plane, okay? Because then we have room to put the feet in. Now, here's the catch about drawing a circle. Is that when you're sketching a circle, okay, if you throw a line down it, what's what we call a center line, it indicates where the front of the object is, okay? So for example, I'm gonna come over here on this line and I'm gonna throw down a center line going like this. So if I come up to the top of my bag and I think of my bag as being a wedge shape like this in perspective, and if I draw through my shape and I can see underneath that wedge, my center line is gonna do this. It's gonna come over here. My center line is gonna go up there. And then if I draw through part of my shape right here, my center line is going to go back that way. It's going to drop down the back of my bag and come down behind like this. Okay, that's my center line for that particular character. But what if I want to turn my bag completely sideways? So now if I come over here and if I draw my wedge shape like this, you see the difference? Is now my wedge shape is sideways. Okay, so 
the side line, and there's actually two axes lines whenever you do a drawing. You have a front axis line and you have a side axis line, right? So here I drew the front line. So if I come in green, the side axis line to my character was here, and then it sort of comes down here to the sphere and it goes around the sphere like this. Do you see that? On this pose, now I can't see the front axis line, can I? But when I sketch him, I can think about my character having a side axis line like this, dot, 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 come back here like so, dot, 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 dot. See how that connects? That's gonna help me a lot because once I start to rotate my character into shape, into three-dimensional form, this is going to allow me to draw and expedite part of the flow to my character, and there's a reason for this. The most important part of that reason is understanding where the feet connect, okay? This shape that I'm drawing right here and right here that is connected with this upper wedge, there's a, dr a direct correlation to this shape. Okay, so here, sometimes I like to sketch that side, that's my side line, right? So a human being has shoulders. Our shoulder line is dict dictates where our feet are. In fact, here's a little secret. I was a wrestler in high school, right? When you push your opponent, wherever the shoulder goes is where the foot goes. So if someone pushes me this way, see where my shoulder is? My foot is right underneath it. Why? If my foot's not there, I'm going to tumble over. It's a support system. And our brains are pre-ordered that way to automatically do that. And the same thing happens when you draw. If you draw a character and your character's leaning over far to one side, you have to have this understanding that, hey, this is where the shoulder is. So up here, I might have part of a flop to my bag, but down here is gonna be where that foot is gonna be landing on the ground. You see that? The rest of it is my back. So that's how you sketch a bag from a side angle, and you start to rotate it into a three-quarter turn, like so. So now, if I come over here, I, need, I can now figure out how do I see that foot on the other side of my back. I have to draw through the shape and I understand that if this foot connects right here, the other side of my sphere is over there. Does that make sense? So the foot now would be coming over in this direction, and that other little part of the sack might be like this, and it would be shaded. It would be out of, it would be around from the other side. Does that make sense? Because if you draw the, f the feet incorrectly while you're turning your little flower sack in a pose, it's going to look wrong. Okay? So... This is important to me because this actually brings a super duper simple principle to mind, which we will do later in this class, which is part of designing, which is understanding how to do a character turnaround correctly. A lot of people do it incorrectly. So, I know this might be new to some of you, and you might be like, man, I don't want to have to draw with shapes. But if I come over and look at your sketch, I could notice little problems with it. And one of those is some of you, every artist that starts to draw, that has never been taught how to draw, draws this way first, front views, and then they draw this way, side views. And the reason why they do that is nobody's ever showed you how to turn form. And there's one way to understand how to turn form, is you really have to understand how to wrap things with rubber bands or lines, axis lines. You have different types. You have front axis lines, you have side axis lines, right? I don't do the red and the green every time I draw. It's too overwhelming, okay? But what I do do when I'm sitting and I'm sketching a particular character, as soon as I go like this, one of the things I do is I come in here and I throw in a position of where an arm might connect, and then I throw an axis line down the side like that, okay? sort of like a side axis line. And it doesn't matter if I'm drawing a character from a front view. I understand where that axis line is coming over and I understand how part of my bag or my shape is working together, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so if I'm gonna sit and do a whole bunch of sketches of a bag and figure out how to do it, eventually I'm gonna get tired with front views and side views. You're gonna have to learn how to rotate your character 
into a three quarter view and this is how you do it. You have to understand where your ground plane is and the reason why you have to know that is because your character's feet are going to plant down to that ground plane. And if I know the shoulders are here, I know that this other foot is gonna come down and it's gonna land about right here and I know the other foot now is gonna come down and be behind here. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you think about it, not to make this any more confusing than it is, and I'm not trying to make it confusing, is that a lot of times when I'm sketching, this is one of the things I do, is when I throw down that, I think of this as a horizon line sometimes, this little ground plane, sometimes I do this right here. I throw a little circle, I come over here, and I draw from the middle, the radius, and I draw a line up like this. And the reason that I do that is now as I come in here and I sketch my bag doing something, okay, I can come back down and I know where my radius is. See that? Now I'm looking around and I see people sleeping and I'm about to kick some ass in a minute here. So wake up, okay? Because then when I come around and I go, where's the principle of drawing the ellipse down? You're like, I don't know. Get your sleep before you come to class, right? So if I draw a line over, I know that foot is gonna land right here. So if I come back down and I sketch this foot landing right here, it makes sense. So then if I follow that line backwards to this way, that's where the rear foot is gonna hit. Does that make sense? The position of the feet landing on the ground plane is pivotal to characters because it identifies a perspective and makes it look right. Okay, so eventually a little bit later, okay, see that? My bag looks correct, doesn't it? The visual weight looks correct. And part of the reason why that looks correct, folks, is because this is the basics of understanding three-dimensional form, turning, and how things anchor to a ground plane, okay? I look at student work all the time, and I always get this. I get a character that's like this, and it's standing, and you come over here, and one foot is facing towards me, and the other foot is sideways. People don't stand like this. It's really difficult to do that, okay? I don't know anybody that does that, okay? You can pull it off sometimes in a character sketch, but it's not accurate. So to really get that feel like your character is doing something, and it's really correct, you have to think about this little scenario. And guess what? I call this little thing right here the upside down T. So when you get to a higher level and you're drawing mechs and you're drawing spaceships and you're drawing all kinds of things from your imagination, the first thing that we do when we're sketching is we throw in a line, I come in here, I throw in my T, I measure another line back like this, I throw in another T, and what I've just done is I've established the center line for a spaceship and then I can come back into my spaceship now, and then I can build out the parts for it. I can put depth to part of my ship. I can come over here, draw through the other side. I can figure out that if that wing lands right there, and I come back over to here, the other wing is gonna come out to about there. I can bring out the back of my ship. I can sketch in the side of the ship. I can figure out what the other wing's gonna look like. You see how quickly I can do that, okay? So that's something that's not just Phil's invention, this is something that other people talk about. They might not call it the upside down T, but it's just what I happen to call it because it applies to everything that I do. So if I'm sitting in the easel class and I'm sketching somebody, okay? Oops, I need to undo my, my layers there. Oops, and I hit E, let me get out of E, let me close that. So come back here, take my eraser, get a little bit bigger, let me erase this real fast. So if I'm gonna sketch a human being, we never start with details. The first thing I look at is where is that person sitting and where is the horizon line in relationship to them? So if I have somebody that's sitting on a box like that, okay, all I have to do is figure out, I can start with actually part of their butt, seeing where they're anchored, because then everything from here is looking up at them. I'm looking at their shape they have, I'm gonna basically draw the wooden mannequin. I have their torso that's there. I have the base of their head. Maybe their head's looking up this way, okay? I can now figure out from this structure right here how the legs are going. So I might have a leg that comes this way. 
I can look over and see how their foot comes down. I can figure out how that foot is landing down on the ground. I can even look over at the other leg. Maybe the other leg is coming this way behind the box. I can see how that comes down. Maybe their foot lands like here, okay? Maybe they have one arm that's coming out and they have one hand on their leg and maybe over here they have the other hand and it's going in the air like so and their hands up like that, okay? I don't have to memorize the human figure. All I have to do is understand basics of proportion and understand how this anchors down to a ground plane and most importantly with figure drawing when you get better at it, you understand that. That's a center line in there which is called a line of action, okay? So let me turn this off and let's go back and then I'm going to wrap this up really quick and we're going to talk about what are these three principles here that Phil just talked about today. Counter angle, so you don't end up having lines that are all horizontal because in the world of drawing, okay, oops, in the world of drawing if we have a bag or a human and our baseline is the same line as that line and it's the same line as that line, it looks stiff and it looks boring, okay. Line of action is us thinking about exactly what our character is going to be doing. So if we have a bag and our character is leaning forward and he's just discovered a, a little butterfly or a little bug sitting down here and he's looking at it, okay, we can look at that guy and we can determine, hey, line of action wrapping down around here. And then we also even have a little side line of action as well, okay, depending on the view. Most important is this right here, is us having the ability to understand that what's really happening in part of our construction is we can see our bag as a wedge shape, like so. Okay, we can look at him from that point of view. We can therefore turn him very quickly in, in our memory just by drawing a wedge shape like this. And I can also have him leaning forward, looking at something because I can think about the simple construction shapes that make him work. Okay, construction is valid and extremely important and part of the reason why it's so important is that there are important point in times when you go to draw and you will look at a drawing and you'll be like, I do not know how to figure that out right now. You're looking at a car or a mech or something that's more complicated. And the way you figure it out is you go back to basics and you go to construction. And what happens is if you draw construction long enough, it transfers into your drawing and then you don't have to use it anymore because it becomes second nature in this. Your brain is communicating a signal to your hand. And the quicker your brain can problem solve and think about a way to identify form and structure, the better your drawings will become, okay? It's that simple. So remember these, these three things. I'm going to save this video now. I'm going to render it out. I'll upload it to YouTube. I'll link it to the blog. You can watch it at home if you have any questions. Sorry I had those little problems earlier. And while you guys are sketching for the rest of class, which is only a couple, 20 more minutes, I probably will make this project due the following Tuesday. So that way you guys have all next week to sit and work in the sketch. Okay? So my big thing I was mentioning is four pages. Try to get four pages of sketching the flower sack, having fun. And if you want to, try a base page your first page, this is what I like to do, is I like to write down and plan little scenarios. For, so my first page might just be general posing. This is just a suggestion, right? My second page might be some form of action. My bag running, jumping, falling, okay? All right, my third page might be an interaction page where I have my bag maybe trying to carry a box or a backpack you can have little elements in fact what if you're what it's so funny because i'm thinking of my daughter this morning going to school just started school this week and she's carrying this backpack with 50 books in it what is her gesture carrying to school here's her gesture getting out of the car she puts on the backs the backpack and as soon as she gets out of the car she's like this and then she goes and she's leaning forward like like have it because if she leans straight up the backpack will pull her back because it has 10 books in it right so that right there is displaying weight so think about that okay that's interaction this one i might put interaction with object okay and it could be a box it could be a ball it could be a backpack and another one 
I might do another interaction, but I'm going to do interaction with a small animal, like a flea, a tick, a butterfly. So now I've given myself a certain direction to move into. When people draw, you are more successful if you give yourself a channel or direction to go. If you just sit there with a blank piece of paper and have no idea what the hell you're going to do, you sit there and you just spin your wheels and you don't accomplish anything. This way you have some other direction to go into. Okay, here's one you could do. Be a little bit more complex. What about a flower sack interacting with a mirror? Where he's all like into the mirror and then in the mirror it has the reverse pose. What about two flower sacks interacting in a conversation? You could do that. Fill the page, have fun with it. I'm giving you freedom to draw. You should be hungry to, to draw right now. Okay, so that's it. Let me stop the recorder, have fun. Okay.